Okay, so here is uh, two combined things from this week. My feedback to your feedback on the 90 second uh, uh, answer uh, assignment and then the chapter 7 countdown questions, my feedback for that. And let me get my uh, laser pointer. Yay! So let's go. First off, the 90 second questions, my feedback on your feedback. So one student uh, wrote that, you know, and well, excuse me, one Okay, so one category of responses was about preparation and presentation. And, and as I, I said before, uh, the 90 second questions, some of them are, you know, ones that you should sit down and say, okay, if I'm going on a job interview, what will they ask me? What will they likely ask me? Why do I want to work here? Tell me about yourself. Uh, so you need to prepare these because if you go to the job interview, why do you want to work here? Uh, uh, e, well, I guess I, you know, that's the horrible way to start the answer. So they're looking for people who seem to know what's going on, to, to have a smart answer. So you need to be prepared. Uh, you know, I think that a lot of you, in terms of the timing and how long your responses were, didn't really think about the situation and plan it out. Like, I gave you a very specific situation. You're going to apply for a job as a uh, HR uh, tech, I think I said. I forget what it was. You could have looked that up on ONET, which you should do, because that's how you prepare for a job interview. Uh, you're going to a company. You're going to research the company on the internet. You're going to uh, research the job on the internet and ONET so you know what you're getting yourself into. And then you can start to big yourself. Yes, that's right. Uh, the whole point of the job interview is to present yourself in your best light. Uh, so <clears throat> that's what you should be thinking about when you're doing your planning for your presentation. And one student said that uh, the fact that managers judge your acts on the first 90 seconds is an interesting factor in itself. I never said that. I said that you should keep your answers to about 90 seconds because that ends up not being too short and not being too long. Uh, and the question about where how you're being judged, well, a lot of cognitive social psychology say that you're being judged in the first six seconds of your interactions with people. Uh, so uh, as I said before, you want to be ready with a good answer and not a, uh, well, uh, gee, I don't know. So uh, 90 seconds, you know, I've you know done job interviews as the interviewer and uh, people who give like 15 second answers, you know, meh, you know, so what? You know, they haven't really thought about it. They don't, they don't seem to care. Uh, people give five minute answers tell me about yourself and then like four minutes later I'm still listening I don't want to work with these people if that's how they're gonna act you know you know uh, on the job which is like I wanna have a conversation with them and they dominate it so uh, that's why I say 90 seconds that's why most people say 90 seconds Okay, uh, and then the other set of uh, questions or responses were about EEOC law. And uh, this student said uh, they often get asked uh, personal information about religion, uh, you know, during job interviews, and that is just flat out illegal. Uh, you know, even if the uh, employer has a good reason to be concerned about your religion, uh, that is, uh, you know, we can, you know, that uh, they're concerned that you're Jewish and that you won't be able to work for Jewish holidays and they want to find out. Well, no, actually that question, that question or that concern is illegal. But let's say that you do, you are concerned about staffing and that's a legal, you know, concern. Uh, you know, but you know, legally you're required as an employer to try to be flexible and, you know, try to have a reasonable accommodations for people's religious schedules. So if it's possible to, you know, uh, find uh, non-Jewish workers who will work during the holy days, then you go ahead and do it. 
uh, if it's possible to schedule, uh, you know, uh, you know, rest periods uh, when daily prayers are, are uh, should be said, uh, then, and it's not difficult to do so, then they should do that. Uh, the student very correctly said they declined many jobs when they felt the crescents were too personal. That's a good thing to do. Uh, one thing I noted here, uh, they said that restaurant jobs, uh, feeling comfortable wearing certain clothes. Uh, you know, I think that they were talking about whether or not there, there was a dress code at the restaurant they worked at. And, uh, you know, you can't ask about dress or you can't judge on looks, uh, you know, uh, during a job interview unless uh, it's a bona fide occupational quality question. That is, a bona fide occupational qualification is something that is important about the job itself. And so you ask yourself, well, how can, how can Hooters, uh, and if you're not aware of what Hooters is, look it up, uh, how can Hooters just hire, uh, you know, uh, women to be their servers? Isn't that, uh, you know, gender discrimination? And well, they have in their job description that they want female uh, workers and also it's a bona fide occupational quality, uh, qualification that they want to have good looking ones. And as long as that is technically one of the uh, qualifications, then it's legal to discriminate based on that. Uh, so uh, you could, uh, you know, ask questions about clothing if the dress is part of the behavioral uh, the bona fide occupational qualif uh, qualifications. Uh, this is how airlines uh, can have weight and height requirements on uh, stewardesses. Uh, this is why the Catholic Church can only hire males for priests and not be charged with sexual discrimination because a bona fide occupational qualification of being a priest is being male. Uh, and I'm glad that a lot of students recognize that talking about your family, you know, your origin or your family or in, uh, your family orientation or your family uh, is something that you should not disclose. And uh, it's not, you know, wrong or it's not illegal for you to talk about yourself and to talk about your origins. But remember, legally, you don't have to number one and number two it's certainly showing the interviewer that you're kind of naive about things uh, but then number three and this is really the most important thing is let's say that somebody is prejudiced against immigrants and you're saying I'm an immigrant or let's say someone is prejudiced against Muslims and you're saying you're a Muslim uh, that is basically asking for trouble. And so the reason why we have these protected classes is to protect people. And one of the protections is you do not have to announce your standing on any of these protected classes so the person will, you know, interviewing you will not know. And that's probably one of the best reasons why. I, you know, and you know, what immigrants do is you know, unbelievable and outstanding. Uh, the adversities that they uh, you know, uh, deal with and overcome, it really is outstanding. And I can imagine why you would want to talk about that as a positive of yourself. Uh, it should be something every immigrant should be proud of. Uh, but again, since there is kind of widespread prejudice against immigrants, uh, enough to get you know who elected president, then I would say maybe you would want to keep it to yourself and the law supports that. So that's uh, my final statement on that, maybe. Uh, and love this. So uh, interviewer cannot ask a woman if she's pregnant. No, because that is a physical health related issue and a family issue. And yeah, the student says, I'm sure uh, after the first interview, if they choose to continue to hire, uh, wouldn't HR and the employer be aware of this? Uh, would they say, well, you know, 
if, for example, we hire her and three months later she uh, has, uh, you know, the baby, uh, you know, won't that cost us money in terms of health care or family leave time? And so won't they refuse to hire her? And the answer is yes, it would. And so that's why you do you are protected against uh, being forced to disclose that you're pregnant or forced to disclose disclose that you have a family and family obligations or forced to disclose that you have a mental illness or forced to disclose that you have a physical illness. And what that means is they hire you without knowing any of that information. They hire you based on your qualifications for the job. Once you're hired, then they can ask you, now that you're hired, uh, you know, is anything going, you know, do we need to know uh, anything about your schedule? Uh, uh, do you plan to, uh, you know, be on sick leave often? Is there any reason about that? Uh, you know, and again, the employer is expected to make reasonable accommodations uh, for whatever protected class related situation that should come up. Uh, you know, a lot of students in this class will tell me, well, you know, you know, they'll say, well, you know, this doesn't make sense because in almost every job interview I'm asked about my visa status or my immigration status. And during the job interview, I'm asked to bring my visa, uh, you know, or my immigration papers to the job interview. And that is absolutely positively illegal. The way that works is you hire someone based on the qualifications and then one of the first things you do in onboarding is you find out about their immigration status and citizenship status and that's when you make decisions on that after they're hired not before and that is absolutely positively illegal uh, and someone uh, said about the EEOC law uh, couldn't asking people about their uh, interests or you know hobbies be a way of legally getting them to accidentally disclose age national origin etc yes it is and so that's why we don't ask those questions uh, during job interviews uh, we don't ask people about uh, what their hobbies are uh, we don't ask them like what they do in their free time uh, we don't ask them what clubs they're members of because that would all be uh, not legal ways of getting people to accidentally disclose, but illegal ways or gray area ways. And so good uh, job interviewers and good HR departments will not let people ask questions like that at all. And then let's move to the countdown questions from Chapter 7. And the discussions were really good. And let's look at uh, Group B's. And uh, group B's is up here. Where do we draw the line between your personal life and work life? Uh, this is a conflict of interest because it is a gray area of one's freedom and can be looked at, at, a, uh, at as a bias in my opinion. Uh, let's unpack that a little bit. This came from the discussion of cyber bet vetting. And, you know, the question is, are companies allowed to look at your Twitter feed, to look at your uh, public Facebook posts. That comes into passive cyber vetting, and that, I have to say, is perfectly legal. Uh, that is, this is public information about you. In some jobs, and especially executive level jobs, uh, the you know company will probably do a uh, data search for you on Google, but also LexisNexis, uh, which is, uh, you know, a, uh, you know, f a pay for a uh, higher quality search engine for news stories uh, to see what uh, there is about you. And they'll probably do also a, a criminal records check. So, uh, you know, uh, any type of information that's public is fair game for uh, the uh, company hiring you. And so the question is, what should you make public in terms of your social media? And if you are looking for work, if you are in a period of uh, your career where you're going to be changing jobs uh, every uh, couple years or so, I would basically keep an eye on my public posts or posts that could end up public. 
but and to be more cautious uh, than uh, liberal about what I would put on to public posts in Twitter or LinkedIn or whatever social media outlet there is. And I believe like uh, MySpace is still around. If you probably don't know what that is, so Google it. Uh, but again, uh, you got to remember these uh, social media sites, they fall out of favor, but then whatever you post there stays there forever, maybe. Now, that's passive, and that's what most people were concerned about. And so it's really not a gray area. Uh, you know, passive cyber vetting, looking at what you have publicly available uh, to, uh, about you, is perfectly legal. Uh, what's really concerning uh, is in the last couple years, two or three years, companies have been doing active cyber betting of uh, you know applicants. What do I mean by app, uh, active? They ask you for your uh, Facebook password and for your Twitter password, and they read your uh, messages on Twitter and you know not your posts but your actual IMs on uh, Twitter and your IMs on uh, Facebook or Instagram or wherever. And this is pretty effing extreme if you think about it. That is, you go in for a job interview and they say, hey, uh, what's your Facebook password? I want to see what you've been saying to people in your emails or your IMs. Uh, now, that is perfectly legal. Uh, it is disturbing. It is a little bit too far in my view, uh, but again, uh, this has been uh, you know uh, talked about in the last two or three years. It's become kind of uh, fair game in job interviews, uh, and it is legal. Uh, the best you know, and I would not use it if I was a job interviewer. Here's why. Remember what I was saying about. Uh, the question about, well, isn't asking people about their hobbies or their, you know, you know, who they hang out with or their clubs, isn't that, you know, a legal way of getting to whether or not they're a protected class? And I said it's not a legal way, it's a gray area way, it's an illegal way. And indeed, if you're going to do active cyber vetting, if you're going to look at people's IMs, what happens if you find out that they are gay? Or what happens if you find out that they are an immigrant? Uh, and, uh, you know, so, and then you also find out that they have a horrible job history. Uh, so you don't hire them because they have a horrible job history. Or maybe they said some really strange, bizarre things about your company. Uh, but then the person says, well, you, you looked at my Facebook IMs, and you know that I'm uh, gay, so why don't uh, I believe, why should I believe that you're not hiring me for a legal reason? Why do you think I, I, maybe you're uh, not hiring me for an illegal reason, that I'm my sexual orientation? So as a, you know, interviewer uh, or an HR uh, rep, I would not use active cyber vetting. Uh, because it's really a gray area in terms of finding out information that you should not know. And this comes very close to uh, the other group's question, which, you know, is that the same basic idea? How does an employee know if they're being discriminated against if they can be fired under the doctrine of employment at will? And that's right. Uh, at will uh, employment, you can be fired for any reason, and you do not have to be tell, told the reason why you're being fired. Uh, the only exception, if they're breaking a contract with you, uh, one of the benefits of unionization is that you have the union there and the union contract. Uh, and also in the state of New York and many other states, if there's an implied contract. Uh, but that's a very specific set of laws and uh, situations. Uh, so any reason, crazy reason, stupid reason, wrong reason, as long as it's not a protected class reason, is a legal reason to fire you, and the employer does not have to explain why. So how do you know you're being discriminated against? Uh, well, if you're in a protected class and you're fired and no reason is given, uh, you need to have evidence. And in general, in terms of filing EEOC 
uh, lawsuits or uh, complaints, the evidence comes down to two different categories. Uh, you know, evidence in terms of statements or actions done specifically targeted to you and statistical. And in this class we've already talked about the statistical evidence and that is the uh, you know adverse uh, impact. That is you get fired and then you notice that a lot of the other people that have been fired are black and you start to ask around and you find out that even though uh, 20 percent of the uh, you know, company is African American. The recent fires make up 90 percent. Uh, the recent fires are 90 percent African American. That's evidence of uh, adverse impact, and now so that would be enough to to file a lawsuit. Uh, but also statements and actions I should have put in there uh, against you. So, for example. Uh, well, here's an extreme case, but it really gets to it. At a college I worked at, the college president said uh, no Jew is ever going to become full professor as long as I'm here. And a Jewish professor went up for full professor and didn't get it. And in the lawsuit, uh, the fact that the president said that thing publicly, that was what was used to win that lawsuit. But then also, uh, you know, you know, if you have disparaging statements made uh, about you because of your uh, protected class before you're fired, that would be evidence that you would use uh, to indicate that uh, you know uh, you were fired because of uh, discrimination. Either case, this is going to be a lawsuit, a legal lawsuit, or it's going to be an EEOC uh, you know complaint. And with the lawsuit, the company will get to uh, uh, contest that and they would certainly make the case that you know you were fired for legal reasons and uh, that would entail a you know uh, you know depositions and possibly a trial uh, by uh, jury so it is a difficult thing to prove but you know people do prove and do win uh, you know uh, you know cases in ter uh, in terms of discrimination all right, so that's it for today. Thank you very much. I'll see you later on.